All right, let's pick up where we left off. So we were just about to talk about peripheral artery diseases. And this is kind of a cool picture. And I put this in here because I kind of like the history of anatomy and physiology. And this is William um, Harvey. And this is one of his drawings in his, his writings, the Anatomical Treatise on the Motion of the Heart and Blood in Animals. And the reason I put this in here is because before him, we really didn't understand what was going on with circulation. In fact, the name artery refers to air vessel because when you die and they slice the the blood vessel open and the artery open, it was full of air. Because when you dial, the pressure goes limp and the blood goes to your feet and it diffuses in tissues and things like that. So when you slice it open, there was a bunch of air inside the arteries. But William Harvey, he actually traced the, or the pathways of the blood and the circulation and showed what would happen if you cut off the circulation. So I, I, this is kind of like my little tribute to uh, his contribution. So getting back on track, here's this flow chart that I made. Remember, I based this off of a, a cardiologist, and I, I wish I could really remember their name. But this is kind of progression. You'll find that the risk factors that happen here that damage the endothelia are going to be the same risk factors that are going to cause peripheral vascular disease and the same risk factors that cause hypertension and myocardial ischemia. So watch for the patterns. I found this really cool slide for you. And this talks a little bit about um, peripheral artery diseases and look at the risk factors. Like I already said, you have the same risk factors as endothelial dysfunctions. When you look at the symptoms, all you have to do is think about, if these are to, to the periphery, the peripheral arteries, what would happen if you clamp off the blood flow? Well, first, what's going to happen to the temperature of that skin if it's not getting good warm blood? It turns cold. What's going to happen to maybe the color? If you're not getting the blood into it, it's going to turn pale. What if the blood sits and stagnates? Well, then it'll turn more blue, right? So, or purple, you know, because of that deoxygenated blood. If you're looking at the circulation down in this tissue, what's going to happen to this tissue? Well, first it's going to atrophy. It's going to start starving, and it's not going to um, be making its accessory structure. So the skin's going to get dry. Maybe it's not making as much oil as it normally does. It's going to become really, um, like, dehydrated looking. It's also going to stop making the accessory organs like the hair. Your hair is going to get really thin in those, that organ that's not getting blood flow, and it's going to start falling out. So one of the first signs of a diabetic that has bad circulation of their feet is that the hair on their toe starts falling off. So just watch for some of the characteristics that you know should happen as an outcome of having damage. And then people with peripheral artery diseases, you can see you have six to seven times higher risk of heart attack and stroke. And uh, here you can see some ulcers that form because of it and even some gangrene that can form. All right. So let's go through some of these. So peripheral artery disease in the first place is um, an atherosclerotic disease. You're decreasing the circulation of these organs because of atherosclerosis. So the pathogenesis is first you get a stenosis or a, a thinning or a narrowing of the diameter of that blood vessel. And then because you're getting a rough area of all that pressure, that high pressure that's trying to blast through that, it gets rough and you get that clot, that thrombus forming. And then if it gets even worse, you can have an embolus that sticks in there. So you can have acute or chronic ischemia. So it, you can have an embolus, which is acute, sets on really quick, you see these symptoms really fast. If it's just a slow, gradual stenosis or thrombus accumulating, you see this chronic change. So slow changes that are happening. Right? And then the symptoms, cool skin, color changes to the tissue, I already said these. You have a higher risk of infection because you can't get healing factors in there. And then as far as the neurons in there, a lot of times you'll get this burning, aching sensation, especially when you're laying flat. Because think about it, when you're standing up, there's at least gravity that's trying to push a little bit more force of the blood down into your feet. But when you're laying down flat, you're not getting your good flow at all into your feet. So you get a lot of these symptoms come out more when you're lying flat. All right, another type, thromboangitis of blood rands. I always think about this because basically you have thrombus and stenosis that's going on, okay, and then it, Angitis is talking about inflammation of the blood vessels, and obliterans is like obliterating them. You're destroying them. Look at this pathway. So here you can see the blood vessels, and they kind of almost come to a complete stop where you have the damage at. What's interesting about this is the primary people that get this are younger men who smoke. And there's a link between the testosterone and the chemicals and the smoking. Both of them have a tendency to vasoconstrict. So what happens is you get such powerful vasoconstriction that it cuts off the blood flow to like the fingers and the toes. And most of the time you actually see it in the hands, but you can actually you see it in the feet too. But a lot of times you see it in their hands. So it's destroying the small and the medium blood vessels. 
causes achiness, tenderness, pain, the same symptoms you saw on the last slide with peripheral artery, disease, artery diseases. So very similar symptoms across the board. And then a lot of times you can actually see the tissue die and you can see gangrene forming. So just one more reason not to smoke. We've talked about this a couple times, so Raynaud's disease. Raynaud's disease is vasospastic problems. And we don't know exactly what causes it, so it's typically idiopathic. We do know it's higher risk in females. We know that temperature has an effect on it. We know that smoking has an effect on it. So temperature and smoking, they're common denominators, vasoconstriction. They both make blood vessels constrict. So a lot of times people will they'll wear, uh, you know, always have mittens on their hands when they go out in the cold, or even in the summer times, they're walking around with their hands in their pocket because they just don't want their, their hands to get cold and, and turn like this. And then Renault's phenomenon means it's secondary to some other thing that's going on. So smoking, um, having that cold, general things like that, that that happen outside that you can affect. Right? So phenomenon is usually secondary to some other change that you can identify. Renault's disease is idiopathic. You know, it can be um, spontaneous spasms in the fingers. And then I put this in here as kind of a review for you because we've seen all of these things before. It's just a nice chance to go back and look at it over and see where the cause is, what's the problem. When we talked about scleroderma, we talked about calcium. So if calcium's accumulating there, give them calcium channel blocker. It slows down the calcium accumulation and keeps the blood flow there longer. Um, things like alpha blockers that they give them that turn down norepinephrine because norepinephrine and epinephrine cause vasoconstriction. So if you can block those receptors, you get less vasoconstriction. So like I said, you can just go through and look on your own. All right. So then venous problems. When you think about the vein, you have to think about the characteristics of the vein. What makes it different than an artery? Arteries have high pressure. Arteries have thick walls, so you can see. Arteries have a smaller lumen than a vein. The lumen remembers the hollow, empty area. So when you look at the veins, there are thinner walls. They're a little bit more stretchy, so they're a little bit more compliant. They have valves, which are very unique, and they have very low pressure. In fact, a lot of the, the moving force of the blood is suction from the heart that's pulling it back up, or the surrounding structures of the veins, like the skeletal muscle out here, squeezing the veins and pumping the blood up. And remember, the blood normally doesn't move backwards because of the valve. So if I squeeze here, it pushes the blood up. And then when it tries to move back, when I relax that muscle, it doesn't. So when you walk, you're actually pumping blood. Right. Another characteristic about the veins is you want to think about if it's depending on skeletal muscle for squeezing, contracting, and pumping blood, what's the big difference between a deep vein that's way down deep in the leg and a vein that's out here superficially along the surface? Well, the surrounding structures. When it's deep in here, it has a lot of support of muscles. So as long as you have strong muscles, it makes that, that vein keep its shape. It keeps it strong. But out here on the surface, as we age, what happens to our skin? Right, it's not so elastic, it doesn't snap back, it's a lot weaker and a lot saggier, so it doesn't support these external veins like this, the veins out here. So these veins have a high tendency to back up, to get stretched out, to allow blood to pool in them, and of course we call that varicose veins. So varicose veins are distended, they're stretched out, so here's a normal vein, you can see that they're stretched out. right? When they stretch out, the valves don't shut efficiently, so blood can go backwards. Tortuous means that they twist and turn. So here you can see a normal vein, and as it gets pushed out, it kind of bends and turns because of all that backflow. So the backflow is bending that, that vein right underneath your skin, making it stretchy. And then palpable, and you can see that they can actually be felt from the surface. So those are the characteristics of a varicose vein. Varicose veins sit out the surface of the body, superficial. And there are a lot of different causes. The primary causes are actually genetics, age, and pressure. So genetics, if your mother has varicose veins, you're more likely to have it. Your diet has a big influence too. You need things like vitamin C that helps you build collagen. You need uh, good protein that helps you build that collagen. So you have strong elastic tissues as long as you possibly can. Um, standing on your feet all day can do it, but as long as you have good healthy veins, it's, you know, it's not that bad. Crossing your legs increases the risk of varicose veins because when you cross your legs, all that blood backs up down here and it can stretch out those vessels. And you do that more frequently and then it uh, you know, causes more and more damage. It's funny when I teach this class in class, I always kind of look around to see how many people have their legs crossed. And after I mention that and I talk about it and you see the pictures, it's amazing. All of the people in the room always uncross their legs. So 
those are some causes, genetics, age, increasing pressure out here, like being on your feet all day or crossing your legs where you're backing up the blood flow. So another problem with chronic venous insufficiency is that you get things called venous stasis ulcers. So having that backed up flow, this is all stagnant blood. So this blood starts pooling in here. This tissue is being damaged and dying because it doesn't get any good fresh oxygenated blood. And then you see, of course, it looks like bruising because you have that deoxygenated blood that's inside of there. So chronic venous insufficiency is more commonly associated with things like leg swelling. Where varicose veins, you see the veins themselves bulging. With chronic venous insufficiency, more leg swelling. You see more of a general tissue discoloration. And then you also see these venous ulcers that, that start accumulating. Right. Deep vein thrombosis, or a lot of times it's commonly abbreviated DVT, is really dangerous. This actually poses a serious health risk. Varicose veins are typically just ugly, and they're not a real high risk to your health. But deep vein thrombosis, the size of these veins, when you start accumulating clots inside of here, so if this roughens up because of pressure changes or damage to the wall, if that clot starts forming, that thrombus in the deep veins, hence deep vein thrombosis, when it starts forming, if it breaks free and starts moving up, it can move up, travel up into the inferior vena cava, if it's from the, the lower leg, and then up and into the atria, to the ventricle, and then out through the pulmonary arteries. I'm giving a specific pathway for a reason. Where do most of these thrombi start lodging into? If they start here in the leg and they move into a, another vein, as you go further down the veins, they get bigger because they start pulling together. So you can see these veins are coming together. They form a larger vein. That larger vein goes into the atria, which is even larger, which goes into the ventricle, which is even larger. And then it goes out. So once it goes into the right ventricle and comes out into the pulmonary arteries, now these arteries go smaller and smaller as so they go into arterioles and capillaries. So once it goes into the heart, into the right side from anywhere in the system, then it goes to the pulmonary circulation, goes to the lungs and can block up the lungs. And I kind of talked about that in the last section that we talked about. So this can pose a serious health risk. It can get lodged in the lungs, it can get lodged in the heart. So there are a lot of places it can actually cause problems at, and it can be potentially fatal once it becomes an emboli. So some of the common causes, inactivity. So being bedridden for a long time, that blood can pool there, it can stick, especially if you're putting pressure on that vein for a long time. Um, when you're in a seated position for a really long time, that's why people that are pregnant, they tell them not to be in a seated position for a long time because all the extra weight puts pressure on their veins. Pregnancy is also another cause of deep vein thrombosis. Obesity, having infections, some different cancers, these are all causes. Anything that could potentially cause pressure or compression, which would lead to a thrombus accumulating. Right? Here you can see a problem. When this is clogging up, I wish I could have found a, a cartoon, but I know you know this. From when you're a kid, you always see like in the cartoon somebody wants to use a fire hose to spray somebody down, they tie a knot in the fire hose. Well, if you tie a knot in the hose or you put a crimp in this blood vessel hose, all that blood starts backing up here. Well, imagine if you have this clot right here in the leg. All the blood starts pooling in the lower leg. I was actually in Panera last week, and I, it was a teenage girl that was there, and she was wearing really tight support hoses, and her legs were really huge. I mean, she had a really thin body, but her legs were really large. And I just sometimes I just want to say, oh, it, it, yeah, I feel like a jerk saying it, but I just want to ask what, what's going on because... In my mind, I can kind of predict what's going on. I'm sure she had um, some deep vein thrombosis going on. Superior vena cava syndrome. This commonly happens with, well, I shouldn't say commonly. When you see this, it's usually because of cancers and a specific type of cancer. So look at this. With superior vena cava syndrome, what's happening is there's a tumor that's growing and compressing the superior vena cava. So now the blood flow from all of the upper part of the body, the arms, the head, the neck, the face, it can't get down and into the heart to be returned. So all this blood starts backing up in these upper body parts, the superior body parts. So where is this tumor growing? What kind of cancer is this? Tink. Lung. So about 2 to 4% of the lung cancer cases will actually have the superior vena cava syndrome. And you can see all those veins, because they're getting backed up pressure, start bulging out, and you can see them all over. Even in the lower part of her face, down her arms, you can see it. So the leading symptoms of this are actually facial edema, distended veins in the neck, sometimes the chest, the arms. They get a lot of shortness of breath because they're not getting adequate blood flow. 
right? The blood backs up in the brain and can actually cause increased intracranial pressure too. But of course, since it's backing up blood flow, you see all the other signs we saw with cardiac issues. So um, they get lightheaded easily, they get tired when they do any exertion, they get fatigued really easy, headaches, confusion, all of those things. Okay, so now let's go on to hypertension. And with hypertension, there are a lot of different types. The most common in about 92 to 95% of all the cases is primary hypertension. And primary hypertension, they also call it essential hypertension because they thought, well, it must be part of your essence. It's just who you are because we didn't know what was the cause. So it just must be your essence or who you are. Nowadays, we call that genetic. It's part of who you are that's causing it. Otherwise, it's typically what we consider genetic and environmental because if your parents both had hypertension, you don't necessarily have to get it. Your odds are higher, but if you take care of yourself and change your environment, it reduces your risk. So it's a combination of different factors. And you can see with this flow chart, it can be things like insulin resistance. It could be a problem with your sympathetic nervous system or the way that your renin angiotensin aldosterone system works. It can be because of different hormones. It can be because of inflammatory response. So any of these things can happen. All of these things actually cause vasoconstriction and re retaining water. So they cause a higher blood volume and a higher blood pressure. So you increase the resistance, you increase the blood volume, and suddenly, poof, hypertension. Remember, your blood pressure primarily revolves around blood vessel constriction and blood volume. So you increase the volume, you increase the pressure. You decrease the volume, you decrease the pressure. You squeeze the blood vessels, it increases the pressure in the vessels, causing greater tension. You relax the blood vessel, it lowers the tension. Right? So primary hypertension, you want to remember it's idiopathic, but it's also the most common. And a lot of times what they'll do is the first medication they give is something to reduce blood volume. So they give them something to drop the blood volume. If you drop the blood volume, what happens right away? your blood pressure starts going down. Well, the problem is that a lot of people, that's not really fixing the cause. It's trying to get them through a hump to help temporarily lower the blood pressure because once you drop their blood pressure, a lot of times what happens is they will kick in mechanisms to help bring it right back up. So then you have to go a little bit deeper and think about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If you can stop that angiotensin II from becoming active, that thing turns on lots of different th mechanisms that raise your blood pressure helps you retain salt, helps you squeeze or vasoconstrict blood vessels, helps you retain water, helps make you thirsty. If you can stop angiotensin 1 from becoming angiotensin 2, you stop all those mechanisms. So one of the next drugs that they'll commonly give is called an ACE inhibitor, which turns off angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, which helps lower the blood pressure. Right? And secondary hypertension, secondary this is kind of a theme that you'll notice. When you hear primary, primary typically is talking about whatever organ you're focusing on. So if it's the heart, there's something going on with the heart. Secondary typically talks about something that's outside of that organ. So secondary is typically caused by some kind of systemic disease. It can be caused by the kidneys being a problem or your nervous system being a problem. Right? And then here is kind of a, a picture that helps you remember. Hypertension is caused by cardiac output or vascular resistance. So if you start affecting the blood volume, like I said, you affect the cardiac output. Stress can do that. A pheochromocytoma can do it. Pheochromocytoma is referring to a toma, a tumor, abnormal growth in the adrenal glands. It releases too many catecholamines, which are epinephrine and norepinephrine. So how could that affect cardiac output? Well, if you have too much adrenaline, it squeezes your blood vessels, causing vascular constriction. Notice that's why it's over on this side too. Okay. Pheochromocytoma also increases your heart rate which incre and also increases your stroke volume. So it's increasing your cardiac output. Over here it's increasing the resistance to the blood vessels. So you can look at both perspectives. What's happening to your blood vessels? What happens to your heart? Both of them can cause hypertension. Right. And then there's just a bunch of examples of things that could be happening. Okay, some other kinds of hypertension, isolated systolic hypertension. This is due to reduced compliance. So when you're not able to be more compliant and allow proper filling of the blood vessels, then it causes something called isolated systolic hypertension. The risk of this actually increases with age and it kind of revolves around the aorta's compliance is primarily what's going on. 
And then complicated hypertension, this is long-term damage again, and this is because of the blood vessel walls in general. Right. And then malignant hypertension just means it's rapidly progressing. They, a lot of times you'll hear them call this hypertensive emergency too. And this is typically revolving around people with collagen disorders, um, kidney disorders, it could be revolving around pregnancy, thyroid issues, where they have really rapid changes in their blood pressure. All right, so homework number three, we've talked about some causes, some symptoms, and contributing factors to hypertension. So how is it treated? And I kind of slipped and told you a couple ways, but I want you to look it up, make sure you use your source. What's the first medicine they usually try? What's another medicine they usually use down the road? And why do they use that? And then what do they tell you to do about your lifestyle? So kind of in your mind, explain to me, if you're obese, what happens to your blood pressure when you jump on a treadmill? Oh my gosh, it skyrockets, it goes to the roof. So how could that be good for you to start getting on a treadmill if you're an obese person and losing weight? How does that help hypertension? How does it reduce hypertension? Think about that and kind of answer that question. All right, since we're talking about blood pressure, I'm just gonna go ahead and go through the blood pressure issues. So we'll talk about the different forms of hypotension. And this first one's orthostatic or postural hypotension. Here's your normal pathway. So when you stand up normally, the blood wants to go to your feet, right? So your sympathetic nervous system kicks in, it detects you have that drop in blood pressure, it kicks in and causes adrenaline to be released, and it causes vasoconstriction. Well, when you constrict your arm blood vessels, your leg blood vessels, your kidney blood vessels, you're pushing all of that blood to your core, up into your heart, and up to your brain rapidly. Remember, nervous system's a rapid change. That's a normal response. A lot of times with orthostatic hypotension, it's damage to the central nervous system, like sympathetic nervous system specifically. So you stand up, your sympathetic doesn't kick in right away. So actually, let's walk through this. You could put somebody in this stress, you know, do different types of stress tests. Here you have the tilt table. So you put them in a tilt table, you stand them up. First thing you're going to notice is that their face turns pale. Why would their face turn pale? Well, pale means there's no blood in there. What happened to their blood? It left their face, left their head, and started going down towards their feet and their arms. So when that blood left their head, how do they start feeling? Lightheaded and dizzy. So you can see their support is strapped on here tight. So what happens is the blood starts dropping backwards and starts pulling in the arms, the legs, and the abdomen. Right? It reduces their ventricle filling. It reduces their stroke volume or the amount of blood they're pumping out. So the blood pressure drops. Blood pressure going to the, the brain plummets. Normally what happens, norepinephrine is released, causing vasoconstriction, pushing the blood back up to the head. Their heart rate would go up. Their stroke volume would go up as a response to adrenaline. Okay? Their muscle sympathetic nerve activity would increase, which means that they would start constricting skeletal muscle, which squeezes the blood vessels. The same thing with smooth muscle. And then renin angiotensin, aldosterone system kicks in. This is the normal response. But something has broken. Either something about the baroreceptors, something the medulla is broken, something about this neural pathway, so the reflex pathway could be broken. Any of those things can cause it. It could also be um, an infection, an infection causing damage to this pathway. Uh, dehydration can do it. What's, what's kind of interesting is that when it's dehydration related, when they stand up, this loop or pathway still works, right? So you'll see an increase in heart rate, increase in stroke volume. You'll see those things, but unfortunately they don't have enough blood because they have, they're dehydrated so it doesn't push it up. So it's kind of a characteristic that helps you distinguish what's going on. Is it dehydration or is it actual damage to the neural pathway or, or one of the structures? So there are some different ideas to think about. And shock may seem like a little bit misplaced, but again, while we're talking about blood pressure, I'm going to go ahead and get, get it taken care of. So shock comes in lots of different forms. You can have cardiovascular shock, which means that the system's failing to perfuse adequately. If it's the heart doing it, we call it cardiogenic shock. Actually, I'll just go through this. So when you have decreased blood vessel perfusion, so decreased blood flow to the tissues, you're going to have, well, there's a perfusion. You're going to have not enough oxygen for the tissue to keep working. You're not going to have enough glucose for it to work. You're going to see all of the effects as a result. Things like a drop in ATPs, an increase in lactic acid. You're going to see an increase in breakdown of fats and proteins to make glucose. You're going to see accumulation of acids, like acetone, ketone bodies as a result. So you see this long pathway, but the overall effect is that the tissues are not getting enough oxygen and sugar to make energy, and they start slowly shutting down. 
So shock really revolves around the oxygen and the glucose. You're not able to get them to the appropriate tissues. So here are the different types. And here's a list of the ones you have to know. And the first one's cardiogenic. Cardiogenic literally tells you the heart's doing it. So your heart's not pumping hard enough. Your cardiac output's gone down. So either it's bradycardia where it's not pumping fast enough or it's stroke volume went down. Overall, the cardiac output drops. So when you have a decrease in cardiac output, of course you know you're not gonna perfuse the tissues appropriately, right? So just follow straight through here. When you have these drops, you get lightheaded, you get dizzy, lack of tissue perfusion to the brain, not enough metabolism, you pass out, and if it's not corrected, you could die. Hypovolemic means you decrease the blood volume. Hypo, lower, volume, volemic. So this could be something like a bleed out. When you have a cut or a wound and you're bleeding and you're decreasing your volume, it could be because of um, excessive exercising or excessive vomiting and diarrhea. Those are lots of different problems. But the big problem here overall is that you have to remember you do decrease the volume, which decreases the pressure. So one of the problems with a hemorrhage, if you have a hemorrhage and you try and correct this, so your blood volume drops, but then suddenly you release things like adrenaline, right? You start compressing the blood vessels, which raises your blood pressure, which makes you bleed faster. So it actually increases the problem. Right? Neurogenic means you have damage to typically the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic or parasympathetic. So watch the sympathetic. Sympathetic actually drives your blood pressure. So if you lose the ability to affect sympathetic nervous system, you have no vascular control, so your blood vessels just dilate. Well, when you dilate the blood vessels, the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, you get no perfusion to the tissues, and then the tissues start dying. Anaphylactic, I hope you know. We've talked about this before. It means it's well, allergy related. When we gave the example back in the hypersensitivities, I talked about bee venom. It's the same idea. You have this antigen in the environment. The antigen activates IgEs, which release what chemical? They trigger the release of a chemical like histamine. Histamine causes vasodilation. If it's in your, all of your blood vessels, massive vasodilation means a massive drop in blood uh, pressure. This SVR is talking about um, venous return. So if you have a drop in blood vessel constriction, your venous return goes down, which means you're not pushing enough blood into the heart. Right? So your cardiac output goes down, your tissue perfusion goes down, and you know the pattern. And the last one is septic, and it's because of bacteria. And septic is extremely complex. So septic, it actually causes the blood vessels to dilate, but it also causes a lot of toxins to accumulate in your blood too. So overall, you get the exact same effect from all of these. And what you have to worry about in all of them is multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. So in any of them, if you just pick something like sepsis, when you start decreasing the blood flow of the different tissues, let's say you turn down the blood flow of the heart. Well, the heart is going to try and pump harder. It doesn't always work, which means if the heart's not always pumping enough flow to the lungs, you don't pick up enough oxygen. What do you know is going to happen to the kidneys? Well, if your blood volume goes down or your blood pressure goes down, your brain's going to constrict the blood vessels going to the kidneys, which means you're not going to get adequate flow to the kidneys. Two of the first organs you're going to see sh shutting down are going to be the kidneys and the lungs, right? And then the heart and the brain are not far behind. So the kidneys, the lungs, because neither of them are getting adequate tissue. You're trying to push blood through the lungs to pick up oxygen. One of the sucky things about the lungs is if you're low in oxygen, it actually decreases flow through the lungs. It's slowing the flow down to try and pick up more oxygen, which causes a bigger problem. So multiple organ dysfunction syndromes when you have two or more organs that start shutting down, basically. And shock has a tendency to cause that. We'll stop here and go on to the next video.